Hi, today I'm here with Park Howell, business and brand storytelling consultant, keynote speaker, and the host of the podcast Business of Story. He's also the founder and president of Park & Co. How are you doing today, Park? I'm doing great, Keyson. Thanks for having me. Great. Can we kick things off with a little bit about your background and what's your background? How did you end up in the storytelling business? <laughs> well, started with that piano right there, one that looked very similar to it. I, uh, uh, my grandmother was playing the piano when I was a little kid and it blew me away. And I thought, how could that old lady have so much fun on that you know, instrument there? And I thought to myself, I want to learn how to do that. So my mom and dad got me a piano when I was in the third grade. I started playing it and writing songs and just having a blast with it. Uh, went on to study music composition and theory in college. I uh, figured I wasn't going to make a living as a composer, so I also got a degree in journalism communications, and for the last 35 years, I've been in the advertising marketing world uh, using what I learned in music, but really more in the rhythm of communication and writing and that sort of thing. Storytelling came around in about 2004. I was running my own agency in Phoenix, Arizona, and technology with the interwebs had showed up such that it completely changed the face of communication and advertising and marketing. I like to say brands used to own the influence of mass media, but now the masses have become the media and they own the brand story. So I started looking at how do we actually hack through this cacophony of noise out there that all of us deliver through our devices 24 seven with global reach from our kitchen table and actually get brands to stand for something greater. So I started studying storytelling and I found that the dynamics in storytelling are very much like the dynamics in music. So I became kind of a specialist in story composition in theory as it relates to purpose-driven brands or companies that are making a significant impact in the world. And it's just really where my two worlds have intersected from when I was just a little kid to now, um, you know, bordering on old man. And I am just having the time of my life working, consulting, teaching, coaching, and speaking on the power of story internationally. Wow. That's a really cool, interesting background. And I uh, can't tell you how much I agree about the power of storytelling. I, I think I, I originally latched onto it because I was so nervous and get stage fright of giving talks and mm -hmm. started learning about the art of storytelling just to keep myself together and make it easier to be able to get through a talk, but then realize like, whoa, that was so much more interesting. It allowed you to have more room to be creative. It was more fun. Uh, and it realized that the applications go all over the place when you're trying to get your points across. So yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I wished that as a younger person, you know, I mean, as a boy, I wished that they had taught storytelling more in schools. You had English and you had, you know, creative writing and that kind of thing, but it's not the same thing. And I believe in business now that storytelling is probably the most powerful yet underutilized asset uh, for companies. And it's because kids, high school and into college, simply are not taught how to intentionally tell a very short story for big impact, you know, connect with that homo sapien across from them through the context of a story versus what everyone is taught is you got to sound and look smart, lead with logic and reason, show them your deck, your PowerPoint, your chart, your graphs, your data and whatever. And Keyson, my question to you and your listeners are, when was the last time you ever bought anything because of the data? You don't. You buy it with emotion. You buy another way of thinking about that is when was the last time you were ever bored into buying anything? Never. <laughs> you buy with emotion and you justify that purchase with your head. Story comes in to connect and to fan the flames of that emotion. And that's why I think it's such a valuable tool in business today. 100% agree. It's the important part of developing that communication and connection. Let's, yeah. get, into our, let's get into our principles to, for success. What got you here? <laughs> well, you know, the old fashioned way, simply hard work. 
Um, you know, you got you got to give it your all, 100 percent, not 110, but you know, you got to really give it your all. And I like to divide that by two, Kisan, and I would say 50 percent of success is showing up every single day to make it happen, and then 50 percent is following up. So it's not just enough to show up and say you're going to do all this stuff and have these great plans and ideas. You actually have to do what you say you're going to do in a timely manner and follow up on behalf of your customers and your clients and be there for them, anticipate their needs, and you'll be successful because so few people seem to do that, seem to have the wherewithal to show up and then follow up. And it doesn't matter how talented you are, that talent, you will grow your skills simply by following those two things, show up and then follow up. Well, let's take this one apart before we go to the next one, because what my goal is to turn this into some real practical steps. And yeah. I, I particularly fond of this one. I remember my father's mantra was always hard work pays off, hard work pays off. I mean, he, I couldn't tell how many times repeated or we come home and find it written on the wall in the, you know, uh, our bedroom or something. And I, I, I like how you added the part of the follow-up. So I'd love to take this into some tactical steps that mm -hmm. others listening can apply. Yeah. So to do it again, you know, coming out of high school and into college and you're going to start having more and more things piling up on your plate as you're trying to build some experience so that you can land that good job in your early to mid 20s and you can grow on that. Um, start every morning and write down the top three things that you need to do that day, whether you want to do them or not. And quite often there are things you don't want to do, but write them down and do those three things. Now you might have five or six or 10 things you have to do, but I want you to just focus on the top three right now. And that's the showing up. So show up every morning and get those off your plate. Then follow up. And that could be a day or two or a week later. And it could be following up with maybe an assignment you sent in or a project you were doing for somebody or even following up with yourself. How did that go? Did I get it in on time? Did I do what I said I was going to do? So it's, it, I'm a big, big believer in the power of threes. So in showing up, it's just writing down those top three priorities every single day and then follow up on that. Then add three more to the list, three more to the list. And you can get so much accomplished in a, in a short amount of time. You know, a day, there's actually a lot of hours in a day to do a lot of things. And if you can stay focused and, and do that show up, follow up thing, you can accomplish way more in four hours than most people do in eight hours. That's really good. It makes a lot of sense. So when you say follow up, and I'm wondering if I'm going in a different direction on this because I, I think of incidences, sales is a good example, where you go, you do your uh, sales pitch and everything but then you, you, there's no follow-up, right? And I, I feel like that's kind of the, the other half of it was that, hey, you need to be proactive and, and have this. Uh, the job interview, I, I'm on the hiring side, so I'll interview a variety of candidates. And to this day, it still surprises me. I'll interview 10 candidates for a role and maybe only one or two people actually follow up afterwards. And Yeah, it's amazing. If I don't get that follow-up, I'm under the impression there's no interest because right. I'm bombarded with this process. Sometimes we have a really... A uh, high demand role, and we have way. I have one right now. We have close to 100 applicants for it, so we may interview 20 to 30 people, and the only people are going to stick out are the ones that actually followed up. You know, we're not going to chase down the other people. They obviously didn't express the level of interest, and the ones that actually spent the time and wrote the most thoughtful, articulated follow ups are the ones that we really pay attention to. So I, is that part, I mean, is that sort of in the same vein of thinking about follow-up where it's almost like there's a definition of what you're trying to do and really defining what that follow-up is? Because I feel like a lot of times we do things, but it's not all the way through to hit success because there is a component of follow-up that may not have been defined. So it wasn't incorporated for you to really make it a, a full, complete success. Yeah. Well, let's just do the math on that. So say out of every 10 applicants, you get one or two that are going to follow up. And maybe even in that follow-up, you only have one that followed up in a really unique way or a way that caught your attention. 
So for any of you out there, if you are among those 10 applicants and you are the one that follows up in a unique way, you now have placed yourself, given yourself basically a 90% better chance of getting that job. You are 90% more different than everybody else that's looking for that job. And in my world of branding and marketing, differentiation is everything. How do you stand out? And it's what you stand for that stands out in the hearts and minds of your employers or your customers or whatever. So by virtue of not following up, you are completely commoditizing yourself, meaning you're just among the rest of the sheep out there that are blindlessly, mindlessly going through the job search. How hard is it to follow up and write a little note? Be interesting in that note. Express your interest in that program. Send it in. Take you five minutes. And yet it will separate you from the rest of the herd out there. Then, and, and, and then once you land that job, keep doing that follow up because that's what your employer wants out of you. But what you are doing is now differentiating you within the workplace as well as feeding or supporting the brand to differentiate itself in the marketplace because here they have yet another asset who actually is doing what they say they're going to do by simply following up. I mean, it's really I, easy I, to follow up. And yet people, I don't know. Well, what, you know, why though? Is it because it. you forget you're lazy or you didn't know? You didn't define what a follow-up actually is. Yeah, yeah. And I define it right now. Write a note, <laughs> not an email, not a text. Get an old-fashioned pen and paper out. Write a little note and send it in. You will blow away that interviewer because they never get them. And well, I, like I agree. One of the most intimate things. Well, especially if you tailor it that, hey, here's the conversation we had. Here's the highlights of that conversation and bring it to what you want to see come out of it. You know, yeah. yes, I had this great conversation based on everything I heard. I think it would be a great fit for this role. I would love to, you know, have a conversation on the next steps. And, Absolutely. And sort of and then this sticks out because it's not only they send a follow up that said, thank you for your time, but it's like, whoa, they actually paid attention and they showed it. And now I remember this guy because of this person, uh, because of the details that they surfaced when maybe I had 30 meetings that day and it's all a big blur. Well, yeah. those follow ups are the ones that stand out. You know, one of the greatest compliments I ever got, and this was many years ago when I was running my agency and I was in Chicago with a big client of ours in the electronics business. And we were out there on fun, actually. The head of marketing brought me out there and we were playing in a golf tournament with one of the leadership out there and, you know, making some donations and that kind of thing. We were staying at a very nice hotel and they were, you know, all expenses paid. So that was really cool. I had every excuse to rest up my laurels and, you know, have another beer or two and just have fun. And I got a note in that said, hey, Park, I've got something I need to talk with you, you know, right away. I mean, it can wait till tomorrow, but if you've got time today from a completely different client, and I had to tell Mark, who I was with, my client, I said, look, I've got to take this. If someone has a challenge going on and he's like, really? And so I ran over and I took the call, walked him through it, took 10 minutes of my time. He was waiting patiently slash impatiently for me out on the corner to go to dinner. And he came out and he stopped me and he said, you know, Park, that's what I like about you and your company, that you don't let anything just rest. You take care of it. When it pops up, you jump on it and you just make things happen. So I just want to share that with you. And I thought that was just kind of my upbringing and something I just always had thought about, but I, no one had ever called me out on it. And I thought that is a really good example of being there, showing up, and then following up as quickly as you can so that your customers aren't guessing. Your, your employer's not guessing. Did he get it? Did he not get it? Are they doing it? Are they not doing it? Do they want the job? Do they not? I have no idea. I'm now in limbo with this person. I'm literally being ghosted by this person. Makes no sense. I guess I'll move on to the next one. So get ghosting out of your vocabulary. <laughs> Do not ghost anyone. Follow up with them. Yeah, I like that. That was a good, good example. Uh, and it, it sort of carries the impression. Like immediately, people realize, they notice it when how responsive somebody is, how, how they're really doing the extra effort to assure success, whether it's even in the conversation or in the context of a large project. So really like that one. Let's jump into the next uh, principle. What's All what right. else do you have for us? Gosh, what else do I have for? I mean, that's my number one thing. I guess my number two 
And I don't want this to be too esoteric for your listeners, but it has served me well. And I wish I had done this a little bit earlier in my life. When you are trying to decide what you want to do in, in your world and who you want to do it with, make sure that you really stop and listen and understand that person that you're going to be working with to make sure that you're the right fit. I have this thing for our company um, that I call it the rigid and frigid test. So we get called a lot you know, to work with clients and we're very blessed in that area. Um, and I've taken on a lot of bad clients, meaning it wasn't the right fit for me or them and it never works and you never make much money on it and they leave pissed and whatever. So the rigid and frigid test is this. Number one, are they frigid? Meaning, are they only out for themselves? Will they not care what you bring to the party? Will they not appreciate your talents and your abilities? Is it all about them? If it is, I say thank you, but no thank you, and I walk away. The rigid test is, maybe they're the most wonderful people in the world, but they are so fear-based that they are so rigid that you aren't going to be able to help them. They are so stuck in status quo in their own way, even as nice as they are, that your job is going to be to help them move to another place. I mean, in their, in their career, in their job or whatever. And if they are unwilling to trust you and do, you know, work with you to get them to where they want to be, then say thank you, but no thank you, because it'll be a waste of your time. It'll be exhausting to you and you will do nothing but frustrate them because they don't want to change, even though they say that they do. So think about that rigid and frigid test. Now, here's the best way to do it as a young person as you're trying to figure this out, because again, this rigid, frigid test might be sort of strange to you in high school, college, whatever you haven't experienced yet. Here's what I want you to do. The next time you are around your friends or group of people, or maybe it's some of the people you don't know that well, but you think maybe they want to be a friend, try this. Can you go a day without saying anything? Just go a day and listen. And maybe a day is too hard. But say you're going on a road trip or you're going to go and hang out with your pals or whatever, and you got some that are really great pals and others that you know, you're know you not really quite sure about. Go and hang out. Go to that party. Do whatever. Spend the hours with them and see if you can not say a word. You react you know, to what they're saying and just listen to those people around you. The next morning, I believe me, you will have a whole new appreciation of who should be in your life and who should not be in your life just by doing that listening test. It's the first step to my rigid and frigid test. It all requires you to listen, to stop talking and just take it in. That's a good one. There's a lot to be said about listening, period, and that can be a principle of its own, but the point where you're shifting your mindset and concentrating on actually noticing that's what I, I think is really important to be able to do that. Yeah, one of the, the most powerful experiences in my life, I had was a recent graduate. So I was a newbie into the advertising marketing world. And I was working with a company called Peterson Communications in Phoenix. And we had gone over for a client meeting and I was the account coordinator slash account executive. So my job was to listen and take notes and figure out what would be the best course for the client. Well, I was then in there with Sandy Peterson, the owner of the agency, and we got all this download and we were driving back to the office and he started quizzing me on the meeting. And that's when I realized how much I had missed. And I kept saying, gee, I don't know. Gee, I, I, don't, I didn't miss, I didn't hear that. And he was trying to make a point. And he finally said, you know why Park is because you didn't listen. You were so busy talking and trying to demonstrate your smarts, even though I was new to the business. So it was an insecurity on my point. I wasn't listening. I was talking. And it was such a valuable lesson to me that a, a year later, I went to work for this very large electronics company as their, um, in their marketing department as their uh, creative director. And they were launching five products at this big sales conference in two months. And these products were still under development. And so they said, it's your job, Park, now to help, you know, as they, the product uh, marketers develop this stuff, you've got to put the packaging and the branding and the naming and all the stuff and the marketing materials together. 
And they threw me in the lion's den, which was this large conference room. And in it was probably 12 of these product marketers and their assistants. And they looked at me as like the savior because they were nowhere. And it's like, oh, Parks here, the creative director, he'll make this all go away. And I remembered what Sandy told me. And I told myself, I said, Park, just shut up. Don't say a thing and listen to them. You just, just hear them out to the point that they stop talking. <laughs> Took an hour. And I sat there and my assistant, who didn't really know me very well, that's my dog barking back there, then was kind of looking at me nervously like, why isn't this dude saying something? Hey, Hazel, quiet. Sorry about that. That's my adorable golden doodle. Oh, wow. Well, anyways, after they all finally settled down and I had something to say, I learned what the agendas were in the room, who had authority and who didn't, you know, who was going to be an asset and who might be a pain in the ass. And then when I actually had something to say about here's how we're going to proceed, my words had way more gravitas because I had said nothing. They had all talked and they were like waiting for the person to talk. And that was a really amazing um, experience for me where I really learned the power of listening. So you, you remind me of a uh, situation that we had early days of our company where we had two teams that were feuding with each other. And I remember I had to step in as the person in a similar situation to help resolve this. And thinking about that same theme of, at the end of the day, these two teams are just not listening, particularly the one side uh, versus the other. So I, I created up this dynamic and said, hey, we're gonna have this meeting. And I had conversations ahead of time to hear them out. I said, here's kind of where we're at, this and that. Okay, great. I'm gonna create this meeting, but I'm gonna set up these rules and this is how we're gonna play it out. Um, I'm going to allow you to present questions to the other team. And they're basically, you know, you can ask a question, but you can't really make a statement. I don't want you to make an, you know, any kind of direct response back. That's the only thing I want you to do is just really ask these questions. And the whole idea was there was always this comment back and this and that. But the whole point was no, they're not really spending the time to listen to them. So to just say, can I create this dialogue where essentially you have to respond back with questions? And it was, it was interesting. I'm trying to remember that was, it was, a, you had to answer. I think it was the one team that wasn't listening. That was sort of their thing. It's like, I don't want anything direct. Like you can make a comment of a commitment. I think it was something like that. They can ask mm -hmm. questions or you can make a commitment about things. But, you know, I don't want you making a statement or anything. You need to respond back with the questions. So it was really framing around that so that it was forcing these teams to really listen to each other. And it was interesting because within an hour, it was moving to a really positive direction just from that kind of framework and setup. Yeah. Yeah. Listening is hard. It really is. But it can be this so one. powerful when you do it. What else do we have for other success principles? Oh boy, um, I can think of so many uh, distress principles of things I've tried and have got me into hot water, um, which reminds me of the line, uh, every shortcut I ever took in business just led me to disaster faster. <laughs> you have to put in the work. You can't, you can't fake it. You know, they say fake it until you make it. And there's some truth in that. But what they really mean is just have the courage and the vulnerability to go out and pursue what you really love to do. But by God, don't try to take shortcuts on it. There's no practicing that damn piano. There's no shortcut or faster way to get better at that than to sit down and put in the hours. If you want to be a writer, there's no, there's no other way than to sit down and write, write, write. I wrote my book here. The first round I wrote it in, a month or not a month in about three months. And then I looked at it and go, eh. and then I spent the next six years writing and rewriting it. And it got to the point that I had to carve out an hour to 90 minutes every day before I went into the office and said, I'm writing whether I want to or not. And when I've tried that in business, I thought, oh, here's a great new client here. We can make some money here and we'll just do this. this, this. It never works. It, it just, it blows up. So put in the effort.
Don't take shortcuts. Just put in the effort. You have more time than you think. You know, they say life is short and all that. It is. But if you do what I said before, where you, you just prioritize, show up, follow up, you will get more done in four hours than most people get done in eight hours in any one day. Sometimes, you know, it is just painstaking work. And I don't know any other way around it. You just got to put in the work. Easy come, easy go comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of truth to that, that when you sort of look for these shortcuts, low-hanging fruit opportunities, it tends to be short-term rewards. And if you really want the things that are grand success and achievements, you have to work hard towards it. And I, I think of the other component of commitment where it's got to be something that you're willing to put in that work and commit to because it may not be a weekend project to write that book. Yeah. Maybe spending yeah. months or I know I'm getting ready to, to write my third book and it's going to be a very comprehensive reference book. And I'm slotting two years knowing <laughs> I want to get in the mindset to put the work in, <laughs> knowing that this yeah. is an achievement. I want to make sure it's, it's followed through all the way. So I, I really like that, that there are no shortcuts. At the end of the day, you, you got to put in the work. How do we do that? How do we get that level of discipline or mindset and even position ourselves to avoid taking those shortcuts? Find what you love to do. You know, um, you have mom and dad there that are really wanting you to do this, this and be successful here and here. And you might have a boyfriend or girlfriend that's like pushing you to do this over here. And you got buddies that are saying, you know, you should really think about doing this. Push them outside of your, your sphere of what is it that you really want to do. And when you find that, it's no longer work. It's not, it's still, it is work. It is still effort. And you still want to give up but you're not likely to give up if you're really pursuing something you love to do. I did a TED talk, a TEDx talk a couple of years ago that was specifically for high school and young 20 somethings. Um, and it was, it's a TEDx Gilbert, my name, Park Howell, search it out. But the title of it was stop looking for your story and start finding your scenes. Because when you find your scenes and you knit those together, your story will find you. And what I mean by that, is look back when you were a young boy or girl and maybe in junior high or high school or whatever and find those moments in time that have shaped who you are today. And those moments, it's where like this curiosity showed up just or something happened that just completely changed your trajectory in life. Mine was my grandmother playing the piano when I was a little kid. And I said, I want to do that. Well, it's led me to a whole lot of music and a great career um, in something that I love to do. That was just one example of it. I've got examples of, you know, being in high school and, and have, sitting through an advertising uh, lecture from a local agency and just being falling in love and being enamored with the creative that they did. And I'm like, well, I want to do that too. And it does kind of relate to music because they're both creatives. So what could I do in the creative world that I could make a business at and whatever, you know? Um, and I had any number of these intersections of serendipity that has informed who I am today. Trouble is most of us don't pay attention to it and we're following someone else's story. So in my TEDx talk, I show you how to find those moments. And there's even a little exercise at the end of it that when you're done is go down and write down three moments in your life where your passion and your curiosity just overwhelmed you. You start knitting those scenes together and you'll find out what story, what journey you should really be on. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect journey from there on out and everything's going to be roses. Now, it means you're going to be going into the forest on your own path with machete and ax in hand, finding and fighting your way through it. <laughs> you're going to run into ogres. You're going to be chased by bears. You're going to stand on top of great mountains. You're going to pull in. You're going to have great successes and you're going to have massive anguish all in the same time. But the thing is, you're going to love the journey because it's your journey. It's not somebody else's. So find those scenes, knit them together. And that's probably the story that you should be on. That's really great inspiration. 
It's uh reminds me of something I always tell my kids, find what you love to do and be the best in the world at it. And I don't even know if you have to be the best in the world at it. That and I'll just, you know, I think it's a great sentiment, but I think when we set people up to be the best in the world, it's really hard to be at the best of the world at anything. But give it your all. And you know what? You're always gonna find some dude or gal around a corner that does it a little bit better than you, or is a little bit smarter in this area, or is a little bit more creative. That's okay. All that does is ignite in you to work a little bit harder, but just give it your all. I think that was the goal is to allude to that with this sort yeah. of, can I drive to be the best? You know, is that the ultimate goal? And obviously uh, there's the, the the North Star or True North that um, it's just your guiding towards. But I totally hear you on that, Kisan, and I think it is a good sentiment. It's just, you know, give it your all. If you love it, then then do it. Be good at it. Be really good at it. All right. Last question. What's the best mistake you've made? Best mistake I ever made. <laughs> All right. Going back to the little kid again. And I, and I say this is best mistake because I learned a lot from it. So here I am at Saturday morning living up in Seattle. And I don't know, I might've been 12 years old, 11 years old. And I'm watching Looney Tune cartoons and I'm one of seven kids. And so my mom and dad were constantly running and ushering us off, um, you know, to different baseball practices and whatever. And I didn't happen to have one that day. And my dad was loading up the car to take my brothers somewhere else, my sister somewhere else. And they were selling my sister's bike, Melody's bike, blue Schwinn bike. And my dad says, okay, this guy and his daughter are going to show up here in about a half hour. And uh, they want to look at the bike. And I said, dad, how much do you want for the bike? He says, well, we want 14, this $14, give you an idea of how long ago this was. We want 14, but we'll take 10. That's all he said, and then he left. So that was in my head. So I'm watching TV, and about a half hour later, there's a knock on the door, and I'm thinking to myself, who in the world could that be? I go out there, oh, that's right, this guy and this little girl who is already looking at the bike and checking it all out, you know, we're interested in the bike. And the guy's looking at it and says, yeah, my little Angela, I think, really likes the bike. Um, what do you want for it? And I said, well, we want 14, but we'll take 10. <laughs> and as soon as that popped out of my mouth, I realized the error of my ways. And that guy smiled. And he could have given me 10 and said, thank you very much, Sonny. But he gave me $12. He goes, I'll meet you halfway then. But when he left, I just laughed at myself. And I thought, there's a growing up moment. But there was an even more important moment in there when my dad came home and said, oh, I see they bought Mel's bike. What did we get for it? He said, well, we got 12. Oh, he didn't want to pay 14. And then I told my story to my dad. I said, well, I said, we'll take 14. And we want 14, but we'll take 10. And my dad laughed so hard. And he says, that's okay, son, because in my life, I've learned a deal is only good if it's good for both parties. So that's probably one of the most valuable, invaluable mistakes I've ever made that still plays true for me 50 years later. <laughs> uh, Park, thank you so much for taking the time with me and sharing some great stories of anything. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed our conversation. Well, thank you, Kisan. It's just a pleasure to be here. Good luck on your new show. I think it's really, really important work you're doing. And for all you listeners and viewers out there, um, follow your path. Go for it. What you love to do. You may not make a lot of money at it at first. You may not make a lot of money at it ever. But as long as you love it, you're probably going to make a fortune in a lot of different ways. That's a great. I'm going to leave it at that. That's like the perfect way to end it. <laughs>